Well, in these talks, I should be uh, discussing things almost entirely in matrix terms. I don't think there's any need to apologize for that. We're talking about matrix codes, and so I think we have to come down to matrices in any case. But of course, in, in the early days, the, we did depend heavily on the classical um, similarity theory uh, for, uh, the, uh, for getting a start in, in the algorithms. In fact, looking back on it now, I think we uh, might have done a better job if we'd uh, studied the classical literature a little bit more carefully to start with and picked up all that we could use immediately. It's rather interesting, for instance, that it was not until about 1958 that we began to use uh, transformations based on matrices of this type, which we usually now associate with the name of householder in numerical analysis. Uh, well, these were used, of course, extensively in Turnbull and Aitken, and uh, in terms which uh, I think would be almost directly applicable uh, to what we wanted to do. However, there's one consideration that's not present at all in the classical literature, and it's ex absolutely vital for us, and that is the problem of numerical stability. A canonical form is a canonical form as far as the classical literature is concerned, and uh, if it uh, happens to be uh, numerically unstable, that really doesn't uh, influence uh, one's opinion of it from uh, really from the uh, s standard classical point of view. Thus, you find the Jordan canonical form playing a very uh, big role in the classical theory, uh, but it hasn't been anything like so important so far for us uh, because of the uh, unstable nature of its dependence on the transformation. Well, I should be uh, using, uh, throughout these lectures, uh, transformations of a certain type, and they'll be used time and time again. Uh, they are used throughout uh, the algorithms in IcePack, and it's rather important to get very familiar with these transformations and the sorts of things you can do with them. And nowadays, I think the more sophisti uh, sophisticated algorithms uh, are usually developed by, uh, take, uh, by considering uh, just what you can do with transformations of this type and related things in terms of reducing a matrix uh, to a convenient form from the point of view of solving the eigenvalue problem. Of course, we still need existence theorems. In a recent uh, uh, example, as in the QZ algorithm, we started off with the standard existence theorem that given to any two square matrices A and B, there will be unitary transformations uh, U and V which reduce these such that U A V and U B V are simultaneously triangular. And that was the result that was at the back of the thing. And without this, of course, uh, one would never have set out on trying to prove the, uh, trying to establish the Q -Z, uh, some sort of QZ algorithm. Well, all the transformations I shall use will in fact be uh, representable in a standard form in fact, in this form, uh, sometimes I should write T and sometimes H um, uh, if, if I'm, I want to uh, emphasize the fact that I'm concerned um, uh, with the complex case momentarily, I'm trying to remember to use H. So here, alpha is a scalar, and U and V are, are vectors. <coughs> this, uh, this I should call an elementary transformation matrix. Elementary transformation. Well, let's first look at uh, some properties of or matrices uh, that matrices of this kind have in general. This is, of course, a rank one a modification of the identity matrix. Take the product of two such matrices, I plus beta uvt. We find that it is, in fact, a matrix of the same kind with the same u and v. And uh, multiplication gives us immediately that gamma is equal to alpha plus beta plus alpha beta uh, bt u, bt u b, a scalar. And in particular, the product will be the identity matrix if a gamma is zero, and that is if beta is equal to minus alpha over one plus alpha bt u. 
so that the inverse of a matrix, uh, uh, of an um, elementary matrix, is a matrix of the same kind, with the same uh, U and the same V, and with the beta de defined by this relation here. And we see that we, uh, we get, uh, it's possible to do this unless this denominator is zero. Um, <coughs> that is, unless um, uh, VTU is equal to minus one over alpha, in which case the matrix is singular. Well, what about uh, turning to the point of singularity? Are we interested perhaps in the determinant of this thing? The determinant of the sum of two matrices is equal to the sum of two to the nth determinants obtained by taking arbitrary R rows from the first ma uh, matrix and the remaining n minus r from the second. If you look at those, they're nearly all uh, uh, zero because uh, those that come uh, contain two columns drawn from this matrix have parallel columns <coughs> and therefore have zero determinant. And therefore you find the only non-zero ones are the ones of the identity matrix and those obtained from the identity matrix by just taking one column of this. And we have that this is one plus alpha VTU. Um, uh, confirming, of course, singularity in the case when uh, 1 plus alpha VTU is 0. Well, let's look uh, and see um, the effect of using these matrices. We take an arbitrary matrix A and we pre multiply by alpha UVT and we get A plus alpha U into VTA. And I, I can write this in the form A plus alpha U P T. And so uh, we get a rank one modification of A. It's important that we should appreciate exactly what happens, exactly how A is modified. And we uh, should consider this in connection with a certain measure of specialization of U and V. If we think of the rows of, of A as A1T to ANT. This vector here, which is a VT times A, um, this, this vector, in fact, will be a certain linear combination of the rows of A. In practice, our vector V will, uh, will usually be specialized in some way. It will have some zeros and some non-zero elements. And if you look at VTA, you find that this, this, this vector PT, which is VTA, is just a linear combination of some of the rows of A. And we take linear combinations just from the non-zero elements here. So our PT then is a set of linear combinations of, it is a linear combination of so, uh, some of the selected rows of, of A, and then we multiply it by U, and that means that the modification we make to A is just, a, in, in each row, is a, is a multiple of this vector uh, uh, PT. And in practice, U itself will usually have some non-zero elements, and A will be modified only in those rows in which U is, is not zero. Oh, it's a fairly elementary result, but it's very important to be able to think in terms of those when you're trying to make uh, transformations of a matrix to establish certain patterns of zeros in it. And it's in those terms that, of course, the algorithms in the handbook are generally described. But perhaps I might just make the trivial remark here. I should call you my element elementary transformation uh, in general, uh, T. When I apply T to A, if I think of the columns <coughs> as A1 to N, of course, T applies. Might seem almost too trivial to be worth saying. T applies independently to each column. So what happens to each column is quite independent of the, uh, of the nature of the matrix. And we will usually be able to describe our, mat our uh, uh, transformation that we're using it will usually be uh, designed so as to achieve a certain effect on some selected column. It is that column which will determine 
uh, the alpha and the u and the v in our elementary transformation. And we can pick on any individual column and use that to uh, define our t. And uh, the, f uh, the, the presence of the other columns uh, have no influence on this. So now the, uh, the transformations which are used perhaps most commonly in the handbook are elementary transformations which are uh, unitary. And we start off with the one that's perhaps used most, that is transformations of the form uh, I minus 2 U U H, that is that transformation in which the V is equal to the U, um, and with U of, of unit name. These transformations, I said earlier, are now usually associated with householder and most commonly called householder transformations. I shall almost invariably use P to denote a transformation of this kind. But immediately obvious that P is equal to PH, uh, and that P squared is equal, to, uh, if we uh, multiply it out, we see immediately that P squared is equal to I. We could have got that from the general formula, but here it's, uh, it's quite obvious that that is so. Now, <coughs> as I said, when we use a transformation of this kind, we're usually thinking uh, currently in terms of, of one particular column, and for this reason, we're interested um, in the influence of, uh, on, on the effect of pre-multiplying a single vector uh, P, uh, x by a transformation P. Uh, let's, for the moment, go back to our general transformation and supposing then that y is equal to i plus alpha u v t times x, we see that uh, this gives that y is equal to x plus alpha u v t x, uh, which means right in the form y minus x is alpha v t x is a scalar times u. And it means that the u is always equal to the difference between uh, the uh, resulting vector and the initial vector. And uh, it's, uh, we, we will be using this simple result from time to time to determine the, the u that we want. <coughs> well, let's take then a, an arbitrary vector x and ask ourselves whether we can transform it into a second arbitrary vector y by pre-multiplication with a matrix P. And we see immediately that uh, so certainly y cannot be arbitrary uh, because P, <coughs> uh, being a unitary matrix, oh, I should, should have said, of course, that means that P, P, H is equal to I, so that uh, P is unitary. Um, and uh, this, uh, since it's unitary, the length will be preserved, and so we must have that y is equal to x. If, that's, if that weren't so, then clearly we couldn't transform x into y. But there's a second property. Uh, y has got to be equal to px. And therefore, if we consider yhx, it is equal to xhp, ph, which is p, times x. And since P is a Hermitian matrix, as you can see immediately from its form, YHX must be real. And so it's certainly necessary that the length of Y should be the same as the length of X and that YHX should be real. This is sometimes overlooked, uh, of course, uh, perhaps because one plays so often with real uh, vectors. And in this case, uh, YHX has a an accommodating way of turning out to be real. <laughs> um, and when you've done that rather a lot, you tend to forget this condition here. Well, these are necessary, and they turn out to be sufficient. Well, to, to show that they are sufficient, and perhaps uh, it's interesting from our point of view, actually to construct one, given, uh, given uh, that these two results, uh, these two uh, properties uh, are satisfied by y and x. Well, we saw that, um, oh, perhaps just before I do that, I introduce P, the, mat the mat P matrices, uh, 
in that way, but in practice, we very seldom determine them in that way. We, uh, perhaps I call that v VH now, uh, so that I define them originally with a normalized vector there, but in practice, we usually use an unnormalized vector, and so we have our thing in the form I minus U, UH. Um, and now we have to normalize them, so we divide them both by. And so we have them in that form, which is always used in the handbook. You'll see this occurring all the way through. So that's an, an elementary Hermitian, sorry, squared. Elementary Hermitian uh, uh, expressed in terms of a non-normalized vector u, and it has this denominator. Now, the advantage of doing this is that you'll find in practice that in most algorithms, it's the non-normalized version of u that is determined in the straightforward way. Um, and if you insisted on working with v, you would then have to normalize it, and a square root would be required. If you work with a normalized version, you just have this denominator here, and so the square root is avoided. Well, we saw from this general result that if, if it is possible to transform uh, y, uh, y into x, then the vector u, which would have been true of any elementary, uh, any elementary matrix, not the, just Hermitian ones, that u would uh, have to be equal to y minus x. And so, um, if it's going to be possible at all, some, some multiple of I, I, uh, y minus x. So if it's going to be possible at all, uh, it will be of the form i minus 2, uh, y minus x into y minus xh over norm y minus x squared. And let's apply this to x, and we'll see immediately that it does work. It gives us x minus 2, uh, y minus x, um, yhx minus xhx over, and the denominator can be put in the form yhy plus xhx uh, minus yhx plus xhy, and since that's real, it's minus 2yhx. And since we assume that the vectors were of the same length, this part here is 2xhx. And so this, d this denominator is just twice that. And this becomes x minus y minus x, which is y. So in fact, we see that if x and y are of the same length, and if yhx is real, uh, then this transformation which is uh, obviously elementary unitary transformation, does affect the transformation from y to x, from x to y. algorithms in the handbook, um, we use elementary Hermitians in the same way, time and time again. We, uh, what we are interested in, we have a vector, x1, x2, up to xn, and we're interested in uh, leaving first r minus one components of that unchanged, and concentrating all the weight of this uh, bottom part onto xr itself. <coughs> so we want to change that into a y, which looks like this. And then it will have one non-zero component here, and the rest zero. Well, first of all, we, uh, the uh, norm has to be preserved. The length of this vector has to be the same as that one, and so this element here must be equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of those in modulus. And so we have in all the algorithms this important quantity s, which is the sum of xr, uh, sum of the squares of the moduli of xr up to xn. Uh, now we have to, uh, we have to have the 
uh, inner product of this and this real, and so we can't in general have uh, S there. We must have if XR is XR e to the i theta, then all we can get, the only possibilities here are plus or minus S e to the i theta. So that all the, uh, the, 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 the y we get must always be of this form. And notice I can write that the i theta is uh, xr over x. And I haven't yet dealt with the case when xr is 0, but that turns out to be the simplest case. And the reality uh, 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 then doesn't place any restriction because the inner product here will be 0 times this. And so I can get arbitrary phase there in the case when nr xr is 0. Right then, the, the vector y, uh, the vector uh, u occurring in the thing is just uh, y minus x. Uh, well, or x minus y, the sign doesn't matter. And so the corresponding u has zeros in the first r minus 1 positions. And then it has xr uh, minus or plus s e to the i theta, which is s xr over xr. Um, and then in the rem remaining positions, of course, uh, it just has xr plus 1 up to xn. So that's the u which occurs in the elementary transformation in the complex case. And a very nice feature about the u is that uh, its components are the same as those of the vector x that we're working with, uh, except for this one here. And this is very nice because in nearly all the algorithms, we want to remember the transformation, um, and, uh, we, uh, which we do by remembering u. And we can remember, uh, when we remember these things, um, we, can remember in the, the, we can remember them in the storage position they already, or, or, or already occupy. Because after the transformation, these are going to become 0. And so you'll find in nearly all the algorithms, these are just left there. And it's understood that after the transformation has been done, there are zeros, and you're, you're in a very nice position as regards remembering uh, all the information. Now, as I've, uh, uh, the transformation we, uh, we have to do then is i minus u u h over half u squared. And what is u squared? Well, if we uh, remembering that s is, is the square root of the sum of the squares of those, we find that this denominator here is in fact s squared uh, minus or plus 2s xr. So now we have all the information about it. The u is given by that, uh, and, and the, um, the denominator here is given by that. Now, as I've described it, it appears to require um, t two square roots, one in determining xr itself, and one in uh, the, 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 the modulus of xr, <laughs> and one in determining uh, s. But in fact, uh, one can avoid this and reduce it uh, merely to one square root in the whole process. by working, uh, making one's basic quantity s x r. So one computes s squared, which doesn't involve a square root, of course, and one computes x r squared from its real and imaginary parts, and that doesn't involve a square root. And then you can find, uh, do by one square root, you get s x r, which is wanted, wh what is wanted here. And we can write this in the form xr into 1 minus or plus uh, s over xr, which is sxr over xr squared. So if we write, uh, if we use sxr as our basic uh, quantity, sorry, that's s mod xr. If we use mo s mod xr as our basic quantity throughout, we can express these in such a form uh, that the, the, there is only one square root uh, involved in the transformation.
having, having got it then, uh, I shall denote transformations of that kind always by PR. So whenever I use the term PR, it's to be understood that it's an elementary orthogonal transformation of this kind uh, with the UR specialized in such a way as to have its first R minus one component zero. And in practice, it's used to annihilate elements in position R plus one to N uh, of a vector. It's worth noticing that as it, as it stands, it appears that U has non-zero components, of course, in all the positions from R onwards, but if X itself is specialized uh, by having zero components, then since the components of U are those X's itself, uh, the corresponding U will be very specialized and will itself have a lot of zero elements. In fact, in practice, we often have a situation like this, find it happening in the QR algorithm. You have a vector here with a lot of zero elements at the bottom and you perhaps uh, want to uh, annihilate this bottom part. Well then, of course, the XR associated with it will only have three non-zero components, all these here uh, being zero, and so we'll get SRs in PR matrices in practice, which are more specialized than that. They will also have a lot of other zeros, which arise uh, because of the special nature of the matrix that we're operating on. This, this occurs in the, in the Francis QR algorithm. Well, the situation as regards a household of transformations is now in a rather interesting stage because um, the use of household of transformations initially about uh, in around about 1969, 1959 began to replace the earlier use of plane rotations. And before that, plane rotations have been used a great deal and um, usually associated with the name of Gibbons and we uh, we've referred to Gibbons reductions. Now these are based on the use of uh, also of elementary matrices, um, uh, orthogonal matrices, called plane which we call plane rotations. A uh, plane rotation in the IJ plane. The matrix associated with it is equal to the unity matrix uh, with cos theta here, cos theta here, sine theta there, minus sine theta there, and cos theta there. I, I'm sorry, talk about the real case momentarily. <coughs> well, this is obviously uh, an orthogonal matrix. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an ele elementary hermitian. It, isn't, it obviously isn't symmetric. Uh, but in fact, a minor modification in which you use a plus sign there and minus cos there is an elementary hermitian. So it's merely a very, a very uh, s simple modification of it. I think if we were starting again, we might tend to use this uh, transformation all the time instead of that one. It certainly has notational conveniences. Uh, since it's symmetric, it's transposed, transposed is equal to itself, and you don't have to keep remembering whether it is the matrix itself or it's transposed that you want since they are the same, and it, it protects you from little um, uh, trivial errors in, in your algebra. Uh, it has the disadvantage that it's determined it is equal to uh, minus one, the symmetric form has a determinant minus one, uh, uh, whereas the original classical form has plus one. That's, that's sometimes a nuisance in the algorithms. Well, uh, these, uh, if we think in terms of multiplying an arbitrary vector with such a matrix, uh, clearly it affects only xi uh, and xj. Everything else remains unaltered. <coughs> It's interesting if you take the, the symmetric form there to see what, uh, what it corresponds to in terms of elementary hermitians to uh, compute the appropriate uh, U vector, which of course will turn out to have two non-zero components. Well, what happens to these is that they become Xi cos plus Yi plus Xj sine and minus Xi sine plus uh, Xj cos. And of course, the uh, length remains the same. And if you p choose the, the uh, cosine and sine so that uh, xi over cos equals um, 
xj over sine. Uh, then you can make one element vanish, and that is the way in which they're used uh, in nearly all the algorithms. Uh, perhaps the Jacobi algorithm is one of the few exceptions where the choice isn't being made in that particular way. So that after doing this transformation, this ends up as xi squared plus xj squared to the half. And we get the usual formula that cos is equal to xi over square root of xi squared plus xj squared. And the sine is equal to xj over the square root. Uh, when applied, of course, to an arbitrary vector, to, uh, you will have to usually be applying it to a matrix. Uh, the other columns of the matrix uh, the, uh, are affected in this way, just the i's and j's element are involved, and you see four multiplications <coughs> uh, come into the transformation. <coughs> well, the, the trouble with the plane rotation is it uh, introduces only one zero at a time, and each, each transformation involves the calculation of a square root and four multiplications. Whereas the um, elementary Hermitian introduces a whole batch of zeros. And in fact, if you have a full vector here, and this is xr to xn, and you want to achieve the same result with your plane rotations as you achieved with one elementary Hermitian, you do one rotation in the r, r plus one uh, plane, making that into zero, a second one in the r, r plus two plane, making that into zero, and finally one in the rn plane, and each of those involves a square root. If you count up the number of multiplications, you find it's twice as many as uh, with the elementary Hermitian. So you've got n minus r square roots against the one, and uh, twice as many multiplications, and for this reason, uh, generally, for general purposes, the, uh, the uh, plane rotations gradually gave way uh, to the elementary Hermitians, and nearly all the algorithms involved the elementary Hermitians, except in specialized cases where only one zero is involved. For instance, in dealing with tridiagonal matrices, um, the one still uses the plane rotations because uh, then the number of operations becomes the same. Well, that is the situation, I think, as it was until comparatively recently. Uh, but uh, the plane rotation has now made something of a comeback. Um, methods have been uh, discovered recently which are extremely economical. Uh, they uh, avoid uh, the use of square roots. And they cut down this four multiplications to two. And now they're back uh, fully competitive uh, with the householder transformations. Now, there's always an advantage, really, in using these, uh, the plane rotations. They're more selective. Uh, so the, 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 their very weakness, in fact, is their strength. Uh, if the matrix is, is very sparse, uh, uh, then every time that when the element you want to annihilate is, or is already zero, you just skip the appropriate plane, uh, plane rotation. And so it has a sort of flexibility which is only partly present in the elementary Hermitians. So now you've got back nearer to parity, in fact, fully to parity in many respects as regards volume of computation, the case for using them has become quite strong. And I was going to say something about that in a later lecture this week under the title of Gibbons Revisited. I think when this idea was first suggested, and I think Gentleman was probably the first person to talk about it, um, he didn't present it in a very general way, and I think perhaps people did uh, uh, tend to underestimate the effect that it was likely to have. Uh, since, uh, since then, I think his presentation has been improved and generalized a bit, and it's uh, particularly by a young man called Hamerling. And I shall say that something about that in the Gibbons Revisited lecture. Um, and with Hamerling's way of looking at it and presenting it, it's quite possible that we would, if we were starting all over again, go back essentially uh, to the Gibbons method for dealing with real symmetric matrices uh, rather than the household. There may be some small snags, very small snags yet associated with underflow, but as far as stability is concerned, it's perfectly all right. And as far as volume of work is concerned, 
uh, it is somewhat less, and it will be particularly marked in the case of sparse matrices. Well, the reason we use the, um, these orthogonal transformations so much is because of their numerical stability, uh, but we do, in certain circumstances, use elementary matrices which are not orthogonal, and I'd like to say something about those and which ones we use. Um, well perhaps I should have just mentioned here the complex case. In the complex case, the four elements are just a cos bar and a sine bar and a minus sine and a cos. <coughs> Uh, and again, now uh, it's the, the cos and sine are com the C and S are complex, and mod cos squared plus mod sine squared is one. So this is still a, a, a Hermitian matrix, and the S and the C are still uh, determined in, in the same sort of way. And we see that although we are operating on the complex vector, uh, we still annihilate this one, and this w th th this one here becomes square root of mod xi squared. <coughs> plus mod xj squared, and so it always becomes positive, even in the complex case, which it is rather more convenient than with the householder, where you get this arbitrary phase because of the necessity for yh and uh, yhx to be real. Okay, now let's come on to the non-unitary elementary transformations that we use. Uh, these are mainly of the form i minus um, x, ERT, that is uh, specialized uh, in, uh, in that the V associated with the general Hermitian matrix is usually uh, a column of the identity matrix. Here I use ER to denote the ith column of the identity matrix, which just has a, a 1 in the off position. Well, what happens when we pre multiply by that? A becomes A minus X ERT times A. And ERT times A is just the rth row of A itself. And we see that uh, what happens is A is modified in each of its rows by a multiple of its rth row, uh, that multiple being determined by the elements of X. Most commonly, uh, most commonly we use X's which are also specialized. Um, we usually associated with an ER, we're using an X which is zero in positions um, one to r minus one. <coughs> uh, most commonly in, in positions one to, uh, one, to r, uh, one to r itself. So that uh, corresponding, uh, I suppose it'd be more reasonable to, to put a plus sign in there, the corresponding t uh, matrix looks like this. Uh, the X associated it with it uh, having uh, non-zero components uh, everywhere uh, except below uh, the Rth position. Now, an interesting thing about, uh, um, I'll call one in w which is specialized in this way, uh, an MR, a big MR, and that will be always of that form. It will be understood that the vector MR has zeros in all the earlier positions. Now, a very important property from the point of view of the numerical uh, analyst, particularly uh, considerable importance in the error analysis, is the fact that MR times MS, the form of that, well, it's equal to I plus MR ERT plus MS EST plus M R E R T M S E S T. And if R is less than or equal to S, uh, this is zero because M S, if you remember, has no zero, has no uh, has zero elements in positions down to the S, and therefore uh, this uh, rather unpleasant term uh, disappears. And MRMS merely has these two modifications. And so, so, in fact, if MR has these non-zero elements and MS has those non-zero elements, the product just has those two lots of elements and there's no intermixing, no products occur, 
And many times in the error analysis, you get this great simplification. Certainly in the error analysis of Gaussian elimination, this rather trivial fact plays a, an important part in simplifying uh, the analysis. Now, if we just use these as they stand, we run into danger of severe instability. Let's uh, look at the typical thing we do. We've got a vector x1, x2 up to xr, xr plus 1 up to xn. And we want to reduce these elements to zero, uh, leaving the early ones unchanged. And we find we can do that with an mr. All we have to do is to take these elements here to be um, m, uh, these, these are x r plus 1 over xr down to minus xn over xr. And that uh, clearly does the trick. You see the usual thing that the m is parallel to the difference between the, the y and the x. The y, of course, being this. So that y minus x is just, this, just the vector with those components there. When you snag about this, of course, if xr is 0, then the transformation doesn't exist at all. And one always has the situation wherever there's this possibility of breakdown from the point of view of exact computation, there will be the danger of numerical instability in practice, which will occur when the xr is small relative, uh, when, when any of the, when xr is small relative to any of the uh, subsequent components in the vector. In that case, the element of big M will be large, and it turns out in the error analysis, the great enemy <coughs> is a transformation which increases the norm of the matrix A. In the early days, it used to be imagined that was true because it amplified previous rounding errors. Actually, that was a complete misconception. It is nothing really to do with amplifying the previous rounding errors. Uh, the reason why, it, but the main reason why it gives rise to instability is because it introduces into that step itself very large rounding errors, and these occur even if it's the first step so that uh, there are no previous rounding errors to apply. Large norms in the matrix transformations are almost invariably dangerous, and they cause danger in that step itself, and not because of a multiplication of previous rounding errors. So in fact, we never use an MR, or hardly ever, in this crude form. We use what we call a stabilized version of them, and uh, we, first of all, transform XR in the following way. We look for the largest of the components from xr to xn, the largest in absolute magnitude. If it's in position r prime, uh, then we exchange x xr and xr prime. That is equivalent to pre-multiplication with an elementary matrix, which is equal to the identity matrix, except in rows r and r prime, where it has unity elements placed like that, and zeros there. So pre-multiply it by this matrix, which I call I R R prime, defining R R I R R prime to be the identity matrix when R and R prime uh, are the same. In, in which case, no interchange is needed. Well, if one does that, uh, then of course, uh, if one pre-multiplies by this and then by an M R, and now all elements of the M R are less than unity and this ensures numerical stability. And I should refer to those as stabilized, stabilized elementary transformations. And where, wherever uh, we occur, use uh, elementary transformations of this type in the, in, the, in the handbook, they are the stabilized form. They're pre pre uh, preceded by uh, the possibility of an interchange. There's one other uh, elementary transformation that we use, and that is, it's of the form MI, but even more specialized. And this is often important in the same way as the plane rotation. It has the same uh, advantages relative to plane rotations. 
the same advantage relative to the transformation I've just been talking about as plane rotation does to, an, uh, to a, a general elementary Hermitian. It proceeds as, as follows. X x L plus 1 up to Xn. Again, we want to make these elements zero by pre-multiplication with elementary matrices in a, sta in a stable way. But now we proceed element by element, and we compare these two and find the largest and, if necessary, interchange. That is, we multiply with R, R, I, R, R plus 1, if necessary. And now we do a transformation which merely annihilates that. And, of course, the multiplier will necessarily be less than 1. And now we compare that and that, and, if necessary, interchange by multiplying with I, R, R, 2, I, R, R plus 2, and so on, and then multiply by an elementary matrix. And so the zeros are introduced piecemeal, and this has advantages. It takes, av uh, it takes advantage of sparseness in a more convenient way than you can with, uh, with the general transformation. But it also enables you to achieve some results because of its greater flexibility that cannot actually be done with the full elementary tra stabilized uh, transformation I described there. Well, now perhaps I should describe just two basic uses of them, which uh, of the transformation I described, which will occur uh, time and time again. And we'll take a, a square matrix A, and we'll consider the problem of reducing it to upper triangular form. Uh, well, now, let's first of all do it by, here's our matrix A. Let's try to achieve this by means of elementary unitary transformations. And the triangular form is, uh, is introdu introduced piecemeal. We first of all multiply by a, a P0. And we choose that in such a way uh, that it will make the first column have zeros in the subdiagonal element. And we saw how to do that. We saw the elements uh, of the corresponding vector u will mainly be these elements here themselves, apart from the top one, which will involve s, the square root of the sum of the squares of the elements. Um, and so with a p naught, we will be able to make these uh, elements equal to 0. And then we multiply by p1. And it's the second column which will play the vital role. We choose the vector in the, uh, in the p1. Uh, so that it reduces these elements to zero. The vector, of course, will have, being a P1, the first component will be zero. And we saw that when the U has its first component of zero, the first row is, is unaltered, and the other rows are modified uh, by a sum multiple of a linear combination of these rows. And so the zeros we've introduced persist. Similarly, we multiply by P3 make those zero, and a P4, and make those zero. And so the net effect is that we have A multiplied by P0, P1, up to a P n minus 2, and that becomes upper triangular, which uh, usually is called R, most kind of times where it occurs in, in, in the handbook. Now, each of the, each of the P matrices is in the real case orthogonal, or in the complex case, it's a unitary matrix. So the product of this is, in fact, a unitary matrix. We never, or hardly ever, form that matrix explicitly. Certainly, one thing we never do is to compute a P I itself explicitly. We just have the vectors, uh, we just have the vector U. Uh, what we usually do is whenever we work, if we, we remember that U is associated with each of these, and whenever we want to use this orthogonal matrix, Q, uh, we, uh, it, it's the factors that are employed, not, and not Q itself. Um, it's more convenient to call that matrix QH rather than QT. And then we have that A is equal to um, Q times R. So this gives us the QR factorization. And we had the result that we can reduce any matrix to upper triangular form by pre-multiplication with an orthogonal matrix. And that orthogonal matrix Q uh, can be found uh, as the product 
of elementary Hermitians. In fact, we have obviously that the Q is equal to P naught up to Pn minus 2. <coughs> We can use the stabilized MR matrices to do the same thing. Uh, again, we take our full matrix. And we want to reduce it to upper triangular form in a stable way. So we first look for the largest element in this column. And if it's in position 1 prime, we multiply by I11 prime. And then we multiply by an M1 to reduce these to zero. And then we multiply by I22 prime, finding the largest of these, and interchange and multiply by M2 and so on, ending up with um, I44 prime and multiplying by M4. And when we finished it, it's up a triangular. So more, more commonly, for historical reasons, called U in that case. Uh, in the case of elementary matrices, it seems to be called U, and in the case of the orthogonal one, it seems to be called R. Now, notice that in, in all these matrices, um, I, R, R prime, R prime is always greater than or equal to R from the very, from the very nature of the, uh, from the very way in which R prime is selected. Um, let's look at this thing here. Then we have that uh, M4 times I11 prime times M3 times I22 prime times M1 times I11 prime uh, times A is equal to U. Um, now, If you look at the product of these matrices as they stand, uh, <coughs> uh, I could write that, in fact, in the form A is equal to um, I11, the, the inverse of I11 prime is, is I11 prime times M, M1 minus 1 times I22 prime times M2 minus 1 times I33 prime times M3 minus 1. Uh -huh. Where, where have I gone? I see it's because that should be I44 prime that's so confusing. <laughs> uh, I, so it's I11 prime. Ah, yes, yes, that's, that's, that's why. That's, let's start again. So we have A times I11 prime times M1 times I22 prime times M2 times I33 prime times M3. Um, well, let, let's, let's call a halt at that stage, then I won't make so many mistakes. <laughs> it's you. Now, if we didn't do the interchanges, if we, if we ignored the interchanges for the moment, you would, you would have uh, uh, A times M1, M2, M3 is equal to you. And therefore, A is equal to M1 minus 1, M2 minus 1, M3 minus 1 uh, times U. Now, what are the inverse of these elementary matrices like? Well, it's from, from my general result about inverting them. You see that to invert an M1, you just change the sign of the element in, 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 in the column. In general, to invert an MR, you just say change the sign of the subdiagonal elements. So the inverse of these matrices it's just a matrix of the same kind. It looks like that. And it's got from the multipliers you use just by changing the sign and so on. Now, so therefore, in this expression here, we have the m's multiplied together with decreasing suffixes. And we remember that when we did that, we got no intermixing uh, of the um, uh, suffixes. And so the product of these things is just a, a unit lower triangular matrix and the elements here are just the multipliers that we actually used in the elimination with the sign interchanged. But 
If we look at this situation, we find that when we, when we do the same thing here, the presence of these interchanges appears to foul the, foul the whole thing up. Uh, but in fact, you find that you, but by putting in products of these, uh, these uh, interchange matrices, you find that this shows that A, a version of A with its columns permuted, with, with its rows permuted, is equal to um, a matrix M times U, where M is lower triangular and where there is no intermixing of the surfaces, uh, but merely the surfaces occur in a different order. So that what happens when you do the interchanges is you do get a triangular decomposition of A uh, with its rows uh, permuted. And that, that is the way that one needs to look at it from the point of view of our algorithms and the error analysis of them. All right, thank you.